In 1965, Russian cosmonaut Alexei Leonov blasted off into space in what appeared to be a routine journey. This expedition, however, would turn out to be anything but routine. A few years prior, Yuri Gagarin had become the first human to journey into outer space. After a host of American and Soviet missions, the whole world expected Leonov would follow in their footsteps to become the 17th man in space. Due to the secrecy of the Russian space program, not even his close family knew what Leonov was about to do. The whole world watched in awe as the Voskhod 2 mission entered the realms of outer space. Leonov's elderly father, watching from his home while conversing with a congregation of journalists outside, was in shock when Leonov started to exit the spacecraft. As Leonov floated out into space with nothing more than a 4.8-meter tether holding him from the unforgiving emptiness, his father was furious. He ran to the journalists outside and shouted his frustrations. Why is he acting like a juvenile delinquent? Everyone else can complete their mission properly inside the spacecraft. What is he doing clambering about outside? Somebody must tell him to get back inside immediately. He must be punished for this. Leonov had become the first human to perform what is now commonly known as a spacewalk. His young daughter, who was also watching, reportedly hid her face in her hands and cried. What is he doing? Please tell Daddy to get back inside. Their frustration soon turned to pride as they watched the President of the Soviet Union broadcast his congratulations and announce that Russia had become the first country to successfully perform a spacewalk. His family and the public were now happy, thinking the mission had gone as planned. The broadcast had suddenly cut to an interlude of Mozart's Requiem, and the world assumed technical difficulties to be the cause. This was far from the truth. Mission Control knew the cosmonauts were in trouble. They had cut the broadcast at the first sign of jeopardy. Years later, in his book, Leonov wrote, My family were spared the trauma they would have suffered had they known the grave danger that Pasha and I faced in the hours that followed. For the difficulties I experienced in this moment were just the start of a series of dire emergencies that almost cost us our lives. After spending more than 10 minutes outside the spacecraft, Leonov's co-pilot, Pasha Belyayev, signaled to him that it was time to come back in. His mind flashing back to that of a little boy playing outside, with his mother telling him it was time to come in, Leonov reluctantly agreed. It was at this point Leonov realized the problem. His spacesuit had deformed. It had expanded and become very stiff. His feet had pulled away from the boots and his hands from the stiff gloves that held them. Voskhod too was made on a budget. In the dash to get people up into outer space, the Soviets had made the craft as small as possible. Leonov was scheduled to re-enter the small inflatable airlock feet first and slide back into his seat. But Leonov was unable to get back into the airlock feet first, as his suit had become too stiff. He would have to go in head first, but his suit was too large. Their orbit would soon take them into darkness and his life supply would be spent in just 40 minutes. Leonov knew he had to act fast. Without consulting the ground crew, he immediately began to let off air from inside the suit via a valve in its lining. He was risking oxygen starvation but knew it was necessary to get back inside. As Leonov struggled to squeeze himself back into the small tube that was the airlock, his body temperature rose drastically. Once finally inside, he was faced with another impossible problem he would somehow have to turn around and close the airlock. After contorting his body in impossible ways to close the airlock, and once Pasha had opened up the inner hatch, Leonov scrambled into the spacecraft, drenched in sweat and his heart racing. This was just the beginning of their struggle.
Once Leonov regained his composure inside the spacecraft, it was his job as navigator to manage the landing. Checking the instrumentation, he noticed that the automatic guidance system for re-entry was not working. They would have to disable the system and manually perform the landing. With little fuel left to reorient the spacecraft, they would have just one chance to fire the engine before they started the descent. They calculated that whatever they did at this point, they were at least 1,500 kilometers off course. Whatever happened next, they knew landing in Chinese territory was not an option. Relations with China were pretty bad at the time. Their orbit would take them right over Moscow, but they had to find a less densely populated area. Leonov chose a spot just west of the Ural Mountains. His thinking was, even if he had miscalculated and their orbit took them beyond the Ural Mountains, at least they would not land in China. They alerted ground control that the systems had failed and told them that they were going into emergency mode. The descent began. Leonov and Pasha knew there was a problem. It felt as though something was pulling them from behind. The high G-forces confirmed their suspicions. Ten Gs were exerted on the pair. With some of the small blood vessels in their eyes bursting, they saw the problem. A communications cable had remained attached to the orbital module. This had failed to be disconnected properly. The center of the cable became the center of gravity between the two modules and they were trapped in a deadly spin. Luckily, the friction from the air burnt through the cable and the spinning stopped at an altitude of 100 kilometers. One sharp jolt later, the parachute had deployed and everything was still. They floated calmly down to Earth, listening to the wind as they went. They entered a layer of dark cloud. Visibility was poor. It kept getting darker, and the pair thought they were entering a deep gorge. Coming to a halt, the cosmonauts were relieved to be back on Earth. Somewhere on Earth, at least. Peering through the hatch, Leonov realized they were in two meters of snow, but the hatch would not open fully. It was jammed against a big birch tree. The only option they had was to try and rock the module back and forth, freeing the hatch of its position against the tree. Pasha pushed with all his might, and they finally got out. The pair took in a big breath of freezing air. Their position system told them that they had overshot by a further 2,000 kilometers, landing in deepest Siberia. How soon do you think they'll pick us up? Pasha asked, concerned. Leonov tried to make light of their situation, replying, In three months, maybe, they'll find us with dog sleighs. They were in the middle of a thick forest and needed to get a better idea of their location. Leonov tried looking at the sun to determine their position, but it was soon behind thick clouds. They were both aware of the dangers lurking in the Siberian forest, specifically the bears and wolves. It was also mating season. They had been given only one pistol, but they had plenty of ammunition. They could only hope that the ground crew had received their distress signal. It turns out that Moscow did not receive that signal, but luckily a cargo plane flying close to their position did. Eager to help, a search party had been dispatched. The first to arrive was a civilian helicopter. Due to the thick forest surrounding the pair, it was almost impossible to pick them up. The helicopter threw down a flimsy rope ladder, but their spacesuits were too bulky, so they couldn't climb that ladder. As the word got out to other pilots in the area, more and more aircraft started circling them. They tossed gifts down to them, alcohol, an axe, extra clothes, and boots. But the day was giving way to night, and the two cosmonauts knew they would not be rescued that night. They would have to do their best to stay warm and wait for help. The temperature was dropping, and the sweat they had accumulated in their suits was apparently sloshing around up to their knees. 
They had no other choice but to remove the bulky suits, wring the water from their undergarments, and detach the soft lining of the suits to put back on. They could at least move easier now. The parachute from the spacecraft was trapped in some trees, and they tried for a while to get it down for extra insulation, but they could not move it. Hunkering down in the spacecraft, they spent the night in temperatures as low as minus 30 degrees Celsius. The morning had arrived and the pair were awoken to the sound of circling aircraft. In the distance, they could hear voices. Leonov fired a flare. A small group of men came into view. Led by local guides, the party included two doctors, a fellow cosmonaut, and a cameraman who immediately began filming. They explained it would take another 24 hours for another party to chop down enough trees to make a clearing big enough for a helicopter. They would be spending another night in the Siberian wilderness. This night, however, would be much more comfortable. The advance party had built a log cabin, made an enormous fire, and heated water for them to bathe in a specially flown-in tub. They made the pair a feast of sausages, cheese, and bread. By the next morning, they were ready to ski nine kilometers to where the other party had made a clearing. From there, they were taken to their launch site where they were greeted by their chief, Sergei Korolov, and fellow cosmonaut, Yuri Gagarin. They hugged, laughed, and joked. <laughs>